Good evening, everyone. I believe that curriculum, and in particular, assessment against the benchmark of curriculum, has come to dominate higher level teaching. I also believe that at, at the coal face of higher, educa higher education, teaching and learning, several questions have begun, have begun to arise, and these questions are now beginning to come into public discourse. Are we really preparing our students for the future? Do we equip them with the skills that they require to work in industry, to work in academia, to work in all different types of roles? I passionately believe that technology can, can pave a new route for creativity, innovation, teamwork, and active learning. Today, I'm going to talk to you about, about my learning journey, and in particular, I'm going to talk to you about the experience I have over teaching over 22 years at this stage um, of my career. The quest these questions that I mentioned about, you know, are we actually, are we, are we preparing our students for the future? They, they've begun, they have begun to, to bother me a lot and they have been on my mind a lot the last number of years uh, in my career. I have taught at primary level, at second level, third level. I have taught at fourth level where I've taught masters and PhD students. I've taught primary teachers, secondary teachers, and I've been involved in continuing professional development uh, here in CIT. When I think of education, these two quotes come to mind. One, but one by our own W.B. Yeats, when he talks about that education is not the filling of the pail, but it's the lighting of a fire. And the task of the modern educator, according to Lewis, it's basically we need to, to we, we don't want to cut down jungles, we want to irrigate deserts. Education has changed a lot from the classic didactic model, which is the transmission model that many of us would have grown up with. And I hate to say that it's still very much active in many classrooms today, where the teacher was at the top of the classroom and the students were down there. It's a bit like the way we are today, actually, in the, in the auditorium. And, and basically, information transfer was one way. And you can see that all, all the students just put up their hands, they, they, you know, they asked their questions, but there was very little interaction going on between the students and the teacher. The classroom of the future is very different. Our students today are the digital natives. They have grown up with technological tools at their fingertips. Technology shapes their lives. Through social networking, we have the in, you have the um, the merging of web to, of with technology, um, of internet. We have use of internet banking. We book tickets online. We we uh, we get support online. So technology is a huge part of our students' lives today. The classroom of the future is very different in that it's more round tables. Students are are working together in groups. There's lots of discourse going on and there's lots of interaction going on between the teacher and the student. And actually, as the, as the participation goes on in the classroom, the teacher plays a very different role in that they stand back and they have a more kind of a coaching or a facilitating role. Web 2.0 is technology-enabled learning. What this actually means is that in, in it... Web 2.0 takes advantage of the network nature of, of network nature of the web. It encourages social interaction in the classroom, and it's based on the whole idea of social constructivism, that students work together, they learn from each other, and they learn from each other. They they work uh, they work collaboratively, and the interaction really between the student and and the teacher is minimal. So I began my teaching career 22 years ago as an undergraduate. I'm sure some of you might recognize these pictures. This was down in, this is uh, Nakadoon, which is down in East Cork, and I worked down there all through my college years um, uh, in an ecology summer camp. This for me was true experiential learning. 
This was for, for students, teenagers. Um, every day we put on our Wellington boots, we put on our jackets, and we went down to the seashore. And we looked at zonation on the seashore. We collected lots of, lots of uh, organisms. We collected mussels, bits of seaweeds. We put everything into a bucket, and we went back to the classroom. And there, we, we took out the books, and we spent hours going through the books and identifying all the different organisms we had. When I finished my PhD, I set up an experimental science class in Cork, and this was its first of its kind at the time. There was nothing else running in science uh, education for children in Cork, and I ran this for five years, and I ran two sets of courses, one before and after Christmas. And I was working in research at the time, and I remember colleagues in the lab would say to me, are you crazy? You're working Monday to Friday, and then you're going in on a Saturday morning running a class for kids. I absolutely loved these classes. They really gave me energy. And I can tell you, after two and a half hours with kids from about the age of six to 10, I came out with such an, an adrenaline rush. It was just, it was hard to, hard to explain. So these kids came in on a Saturday morning. Uh, I attracted kids from all over Munster. I had kids coming from Limerick, from Waterford, um, from all over Cork City as well. And I had a huge waiting list for these classes. So the first class always sticks in my head. Okay, so they all came in. I had 15 in the class and we sat around on bean bags and we introduced ourselves. And the first, we, we, we had a bit of an ice breaking session because I thought it was good that we all kind of got to know each other. So we sat down and the hands started to go up. So the first hand that went up said to me, Siobhan, I'm really frustrated. When are we doing the experiments? So I said, look, we're going to have to do a bit of theory first before we can do the experiments. But next week, we'll start the experiments. Then I had another student in the corner who was asleep. OK. And I spoke to his mum afterwards, and she told me he was up the whole night because he couldn't sleep. He was so excited about doing the science class. <laughs> OK. Then I, had, um, then I had another guy asking lots of questions about what we were going to be covering in the classes. So I handed out a piece of paper and I said, OK, I want you all to write down what are the things you want to do in this class, OK? So what do you think they're going to write down? So the first thing they said to me was, we want to do lots of experiments. We want to make stink bombs so that we can bring into school, OK? We want to learn about cancer and how it's, how, how it's being treated we want to learn about cystic fibrosis. And in terms of experiments, we want to do loads of dissections. OK, so I said to them, dissections. OK, guys, what do you actually mean by that? So I had one guy in the corner, and his hand shot up. And he said, Siobhan, you have nothing to worry about. I can get you a rat, a rabbit, <laughs> a hedgehog, and a badger. I said, guys, I don't think now we're going to need any of those. OK? And he took out of his pocket his, the business card for his dad, who owned an abattoir, and he slid it across the table. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, we're not going to be cutting up all of those, but I said, we will probably do a heart dissection. We'll do an eye, and we'll look at the lens, and we might do a kidney as well. So the characteristics of these students really stuck with me, because they had so much energy and enthusiasm, and it really bowled me over. The other thing they wanted to do every week is they, you ha they had to have a lab coat because that made them feel as if they were real scientists. So you can see them there with their lab coats on. So they went back to school and they were talking to their teachers about what they were doing in the class on the Saturday morning. So all the teachers were ringing me and they were saying, is there any chance so we can sit in on some of these classes? Now, at this time, science was just coming into the primary curriculum. So a lot of teachers out there had actually never done science before. So when they were ringing me up saying, can we do this? I said, no, no, you can't actually, because this is just for students. But what we can do is we'll have a look at, see if I can set up a course for primary school teachers, which I went on and I did. From there, I went over to Nigeria. I was working with Macmillan Education, and I was commissioned by them to write a textbook in biology, which was geared towards A-level a-level biology uh, students. So it was kind of for college-level students. 
it was such an interesting experience. You could have 60 to 70 students inside in a class and you could hear a pin drop. There was no interaction going on and an awful lot of the learning that was taking place in the classroom was through rote learning. And the students took down tons of information from the board. Back in Ireland, biology had just changed in the curriculum and I was involved in the training of second level teachers in the new curriculum. They came to me and they said, is there any professional development we can do in biology? Because we're really interested in doing this. So out of this came the masters in, in science education in biology, which I taught for a number of years. It was an interesting group. We had 15 students. I was meeting them once a week. I had students who had just completed their, their degree, basically, and I had students who had been teaching for 15 to 20 years. And I thought to myself, they're meeting once a week, they're coming from all over Munster, how am I going to get them to talk to each other? At the time, VLEs were very new on the scene in, in, in third level, virtual learning environments like Blackboard and Moodle. The teachers, had, most of the teachers I had in, the, in that classroom had never used a computer before. And when I started to talk to them about having to use a computer, some of them, their eyes were beginning to well up. So I said to them, if you have a budget, you go and you buy yourself a laptop and you buy yourself a digital camera and leave me worry about the teaching about how you're going to use it, which, which I did. So I set up a discussion board because I thought this was a great way for the teachers to communicate with each other, to share resources. Um, you know, the, the teachers who had been teaching for 15 years could talk about all the teaching they had done. Uh, they, could talk about, um, they could talk about the experience they had, the different subjects they had taught, and the younger teachers could learn so much from them. So I remember when I set up the discussion board on a Tuesday night, I went home and I thought to myself, oh geez, this is going to be a disaster. Okay, and I left it for a couple of days and then on the Friday I got the courage and I went in and I looked at the discussion board and I had 162 messages and I thought, wow, this is just amazing. So they were all communicating with each other, they were sharing resources, the older teachers were telling the, the new teachers, you know, this is how you could do it, sometimes this works, maybe this will work instead, these are really good books, here are some, um, some resources I can share with you. They took lots of pictures in the lab. I encouraged them to use a digital camera, take photographs of everything you're doing in the lab, and you can use them when you're writing your reports, which they did. Then I came to CIT, and I had been there a number of years, and I was tasked with teaching the first year biomedical science students, and I was their coordinator as well. So when my head of department called me in and he said, Siobhan, I'm going to get you to teach a module on creativity, innovation, and teamwork. And I said, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> I can teach something like this, because I had all of these ideas going around in my head, and I really wanted to experiment them out with, uh, with the first-year class. So I was teaching them a module on creativity, innovation, and teamwork, and I was also teaching them human biology as well. So what did I want them to get out of this? I wanted them to interact as a group. I had 64 in a class. I wanted to promote creativity, and we'll have a look at how we can do that in the classroom. I wanted them to experience teamwork. I wanted them to practice, you know, to, to communicate well with each other and, and to, to do lots of presentations so that they could practice all of these skills that we now know are the soft skills that are, that are needed. I also wanted them to experience research. And this was something I felt very strongly about because I feel that often first years are kind of, they don't get to experience much research until they get on later on in their career. So I said to the first years, we're inside, we have, uh, we're in, in Cork, we're surrounded by hospitals, I want you to start making phone calls and start making, you know, having interviews with the biomedical scientists and find out what it's like to be a biomedical scient scientist, which they did. So they looked at, they looked at me in horror, but remember, their first years. So when they come in the door, basically they don't know any better. So they think, oh yeah, everyone has to do this, so we'll do it as well. So they went off and they did it. So they did lots of uh, research. Um, they worked together in groups and they did lots of, uh, they produced lots of material um, as groups. Twitter was very new at the time and I was interested because I thought, you know, this is a great way to communicate with the students at any time. 
I remember it was a Saturday evening, I was at home and I said, you know, I'm going to set up a Twitter account. So I sent a message to all the students. I said, I'm set up on Twitter. And within a couple of hours, I had the whole class on Twitter, which was amazing. We used Twitter to, uh, to do some research. I got them to follow all the scientific journals, all the biomedical science journals, and they were able to do their research that way. They produced newsletters, uh, which contained all the interviews they had done. Um, it contained all the information, what was new in biomedical science. Um, you can see they did interviews. Blogs were a huge part of the, um, of the work that they did. Um, I was very interested in the fact that these were first years and I wanted them to, I wanted to, to get an idea of what was the first year experience like as a, as a coordinator. So they discussed a lot of their first year experience in a reflective blog. In the human biology part, they talked about, uh, they did lots of work on presentations. So the blogs were used for me mainly to, to see what, what was the first year experience like. At the time, I was teaching second years, and they were coming to me and they were saying, this is very unfair. How come we're not doing blogs? So I said, okay, we'll set up a blog with you as well. And the second years talked a lot about their learning experience. They discussed what, what helped them learn in the classroom. They discussed what they liked, what, what, what they liked. They liked the enthusiastic lecture. They liked being able to ask questions in the class, etc. So this was all what they talked about, and it was very informative for me. Um, as a teacher. Many of them expressed deep regret when the blog was finished because they found it a, a really great way in order to express how they, were, how they were feeling and the learning that was taking place. So as a result, I had first years doing blogs, talking about their experience. I had second years doing blogs, so then they started communicating with each other and out of that we developed a mentoring program in the department, which is, was still very much alive today. To conclude, education technology has transformed my teaching practice. There is a huge myth out there that, that, that technology will replace lecturers and will replace educators. My concluding remark to you all is that anyone who thinks they can be replaced by a computer probably deserves to be.